All right. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Erica Smiley, the Executive Director of Jobs with Justice, and she will um, introduce our performer for today, this morning, uh, who is going to start with Monica Ray Simpson. Smiley, take it away. Thank you, Hostess and uh, friends. So glad to see everyone today and to be a part of this first ever virtual National Jobs with Justice Conference. Uh, as always, with any large gathering that we put together, we'd like to start and ground ourselves in this moment with a song. Um, Monica Ray Simpson is a queer Black North Carolina native who has organized extensively against human rights abuse, the prison industry, racism, and system violence against Southern Black women and LGBTQ people. She is currently the executive director of Sister Song, a national membership organization based in the South, focused on institutional policies and systems that impact the reproductive lives of marginalized communities. Monica is also known for infusing her activism with cultural organizing, having appeared in theatrical productions such as For the Love of Harlem, Walk Like a Man, and For Colored Girls. I have the privilege of serving with her on the board of the Highlander Research and Education Center, and we are so honored to have her here to open our conference with a song. Please direct your attention to our fellow traveler, Monica Ray Simpson. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is really an honor and a privilege to be able to be before you all today. Um, I am, like Smiley said, like in the work and all things, the Executive Director of the Reproductive Justice Collective, and I'm also a revolutionary soul singer. I believe in the power of movement music. And today I stand before you wanting to bring in the movement singers that influence in my work every single day. Some of those singers like Odetta, Anina Simone, Mahalia Jackson, and Miriam McCabe. These voices were voices of movements, were voices of times. And what is really important today, when we think about the power of, the, of cultural work, we have to acknowledge the power that it is and how it has shaped the way that we move within our movements. It has been the heartbeat and the pulse of our movements, and I believe cultural workers are the architects and experts of culture shift strategies that are so necessary and important to our work right now. And so um, today I want to bring you a song um, because I do believe that music in our movements not only feed us and soothe us, but also gives us energy to be able to continue the work that we're all committed to. And so I wrote this song a couple of years ago um, called I Know I've Been Changed. It gives honor to my gospel roots and it also for me is a charge as I think about the work that is necessary, the work that is before us, um, and the work that we all are committed to to see liberation in our lifetime. So um, again, the name of the song is I Know I've Been Changed and it is one of my album Revolutionary Love and I'm excited to bring it before you all today. Oh, 
all so much. I know this conference is going to be amazing. I hope that the words of this song is a charge to your hearts and a charge to your spirit that we have the power within us to heal this earth, to move our movements and to see liberation in our lifetime. Thank you so much, Shadows of Justice, for having me. And I look forward to being in connection and seeing what all this day has to bring. Thank you so much, Monica. That was a uh... That was an inspiration, and thank you for singing at our conference. We are so glad to, to know you and to be able to open up uh, our discussions with uh, a moment of culture. So I'll wait for, for everything to catch up, and we'll get started. Again, thank you, Monica. What a wonderful song. It totally woke us up. I'm really proud to introduce our Executive Director of Jobs Justice, Erica Smiley, for some opening words. Take it away, Smiley. Thank you, Jessica, for the prompt. And again, Monica, to remind us that uh, singing and cultural organizing is an active part of our work together, not just from our history, but in our present and our, in our current. And part of what we wanted to do at this conference was to allow us to have a bit of uplift, uh, not just dive straight into all the deep theoretical conversations, but to actually have a moment of reprieve as we kind of struggle and strategize together. Um, today, I'm going to share some thoughts on how this global pandemic further exposed what we already knew about our diseased economy on a so-called normal day how it made clear how urgent it is for working people to collectively bargain, to organize in ways that allow us to bargain collectively uh, in all the ways that we relate to the economy, employment, and beyond, not only to ensure the safety and dignity of workers, but to ensure it for all of us. But before I do that, I want to share a brief reflection on hope. Let's start from the beginning. Just over two months ago, over two months ago today, after deliberating for days and hours at a time with our network leadership, our board, many partners and allies, we made the difficult decision to cancel our national conference in Atlanta to prevent our exposure to and the community spread of COVID-19. Just days before many of us were scheduled to get there, some of us were already on the ground. At least one of our overseas comrades has yet to return home stuck here for a conference that never happened while her sister is on life support in India. It is while carrying the heavy weight of this decision and the corresponding nightmare of the virus that I have the arduous task of helping to introduce and frame our now virtual conference. I know that some of you are expecting me to dive right into our analysis of the problem, our theory of change and project the way forward, and we'll get there. But first, I just wanna make a simple acknowledgement of the haunted circus we're currently living through. We're all in the upside down, or in the sunken place. Nothing seems as it, nothing is as it seems. What is what and who is who? How do we 
calculate if we're winning. What do the polls really tell us about the elections in November? How will it impact the census? When will I see my family again? Last week in New Jersey, parks were closed. This week, they open, perhaps only to close again, if and when the illness picks back up. Perhaps today, you don't know anyone who has contracted the virus, but of course, that does not guarantee tomorrow. There are so many unknowns. And yet, this is the way of things. Even outside of a global pandemic, tomorrow is not promised, and very rarely does anything go as planned. You save up all your money and finally buy that house only to have it ripped away in a big storm. You spend years studying to become a doctor only to get caught up organizing your coworkers and getting elected to lead your union. You try for years to conceive a child only to have one hand delivered to you by the foster system. The ending isn't always bad, but it's rarely predictable. The pandemic only laid bare what was already there, how subject our lives are to unexpected transformation. I know it sounds a little bit like I'm veering down some dark philosophical path, but stay with me because I really want to investigate this notion that the pandemic is exposing what was already there. Allow me to share a short story from my own experience during, during the pandemic. Some of you know that up until last week, my family was living in a temporary rental home while our current house was under construction in a long story that begins with climate change. One uncharacteristically warm Sunday, a few weeks back, while I flustered about the kitchen, attempting to fix dinner, silencing my beeping work phone, trying to prevent a screaming toddler who had just emptied out a cabinet and was now attempting to accidentally murder herself by climbing up the stairs, and managing the generalized anxiety that came from listening to my wife cough constantly while quarantined in the guest room, still unsure about the results of her COVID-19 test earlier that day. While all this was happening, I witnessed the most horrific sight. Out of the kitchen window, I could see our neighbors with a Trump flag blazing aggressively off their front porch, having a raucous afternoon party. At the same time, just behind their Corona vacation, on the main road, I could see people going to work, going to work at the grocery store with homemade masks, migrant workers wearing bandanas around their faces, sitting in close quarters in the cabin of a small truck on their way to landscape the yard of someone's summer home, women going to clean another person's house, and many other essential, bendable, workers who did not want to be out, who did not want to get sick or get anyone else sick, who wanted to practice social distancing but couldn't. And I was pissed and frankly somewhat tempted to take my potentially asymptomatic COVID-19 carrying self over there to ask for a drink. I didn't, but I thought I thought about it. I'm only human. And the thought of spreading the infection to non-believers definitely made me feel a little better. I can't help it. There was something both cathartic and affirming in a seeing the full political economy of our generation, something I and many others have tried to explain in so many words, viewable in just one quick snapshot right in front of me. U.S. hegemony, the daily smog of social norms and culture we all exist in each day, had in fact been infected by COVID-19. In some ways, this has hit many of us harder than the sickness itself, if we're willing to admit it. While we might publicly cringe at the ideals of white is right and pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps is good and women's work is what it is and, and that wealthy family across the street got there because they worked harder than everyone else, of course we would cringe at that, but we might publicly shun those things while at the same time, even the most radical among us secretly knows all the words to Cardi B's Bodak Yellow. As the saying goes, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Even the most left movement leaders in the global north looked down on China and assumed that our countries could handle this crisis so much better. But unlike the flow of capital, this virus seeks proliferation, not profit, and has therefore inadvertently to some extent reversed the direction of the flow. It has mocked immigration controls, biometrics, digital surveillance, and every other kind of data analyt analytics and struck hardest thus far in the richest, most powerful nations of the world bringing the engine of capitalism to a juddering halt, temporarily perhaps, but at least long enough for us to imagine its parts, make an assessment, and decide whether we want to help fix it or look for a better engine. Aaron Dottie Roy always has a way with words. Those were not mine. The COVID ID pandemic burned down the layers of everyday meritocratic blinders of our culture to lay bare the bankrupt economic structure underneath a structure of built-in inequality bolstered by white supremacy and patriarchy. 
who must risk infection so who must risk infection so my neighbors can party who must die to keep the economy running the lieutenant governor of texas said older people must make the sacrifice governor of iowa and other states say get back to work despite the risk of getting or spreading sickness or lose your unemployment in response to increased cases in black communities the georgia governor reopened their economy because who cares it's just it's just them over there yeah their actions are repulsive openly committing a certain population to death but let's please not act surprised because this is the way of our current economy even outside of this pandemic these governors are merely operating in a way that our economic system dictates them to they each stated openly what the invisible hand of the market would consider obvious during our current economy's best days during its best days the poor are getting poorer and sicker women are exploited at work and at home black communities suffer diseases of poverty and violence at the hands of the state and vigilante terrorists poor white communities die deaths of despair from opioids and alcohol addiction and migrant families are kept in a state of constant insecurity and exploitation when the economy is operating at its best all of this is true this is not a new normal it is simply normal it's just perhaps more normal than some of us have ever wanted to admit the part of us that is missing the bliss of ignorance provided by netflix thinks everything is out of whack but in fact everything is working just as it was created to work jeff bezos gained 24 billion dollars off of amazon workers and monopoly practices during the covid 19 pandemic just the last few months he's gained 24 billion dollars sam zell stephen feinberg and other corporate landlords stand to gain more in rent if there, if there even wasn't, if there hadn't been a pandemic, they're going to make more potentially off of the relief packages in Congress. And with very few strings attached, the 1% gets wealthier while the rest of us struggle. Nothing new to see here. And with that, it was time to think about the future, to allow myself to dream and imagine and hope again. Because ironically, it was this thought that gave me some relief from the anger that Sunday afternoon because normal had never worked for me anyway. I wasn't confused. I, I was clear. I was on track. I spent my entire life trying to crush normal and build a democracy with its own norms, focusing on cultural, social, and economic equality. I could still be on purpose, even during a global pandemic. So with that, it was time to imagine the future and to hope again, which is where I started, because it's a weird thing, hope. It's actually very difficult to do, and yet it's a prerequisite for building a better future together. It's not as easy as simply willing it to be so or chanting it at a presidential campaign rally. It takes work. You must constantly overcome your disappointment and disbelief with the reality around you. You must dig deep to see the best in people, even those currently pointing a finger or even a gun at you. Hope is not something you just wake up and have. Hope is something we actively do each day, each hour, each second. We have to fight to maintain hope. It's hope that allows us to plan our next family vacation, even when we don't know when we'll see each other again or be able to afford anything other than a cookout in our backyard. It's hope that allows Amazon workers to talk to their coworkers about having more of a role in the decisions made at their work site, even after the supervisor threatened to fire anyone who talks about organizing. It's hope that allowed hundreds of thousands of workers to participate in the rent strike earlier this month, demanding corporate landlords do their fair share of sacrifice and forgive payments during the pandemic. It's hope that led gig workers to insist on unemployment while their employers, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, consistently denied their employee status. It's hope that allowed migrant workers in Morton, Mississippi to organize after ICE raided their poultry plants, scattering communities and separating families. Hope is our fuel, our fire, and like the combustion that happens when a car accesses gas in its tank, it's not calm, it does not soothe, it ignites our engines and aggressively pushes us forward. We have been called to fill up our tanks and build a road to democracy and equality, all while driving through a guerrilla war zone. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's batshit crazy that we're attempting to do a conference while simultaneously fighting for the immediate needs and long-term survival of the human race. That is crazy. And yet, that is what we're called to do. That is what we must do. Never before, has the need for workers to collectively negotiate over their conditions been more important, not just for them, but for everyone. When workers are sick, we're all sick. 
when workers have a plan, our communities are safe. Many nurses already had plans in place for potential biomedical crises like these. Many of their collective bargaining agreements took us all into account, far beyond what is considered by law mandatory to negotiate over. At my local union grocery store, ShopRite, they have an extensive system for social distancing. They have personal protective equipment. They have a plan. And our community has the confidence that we can safely shop when we need to get items. Meanwhile, down the street at Walmart, the circumstances are less consistent. It doesn't just impact the workers, but every exhausted shopper that stumbles in looking for diapers. Our active leadership in this moment to expand the ability of all working people to organize and collectively bargaining in their workplaces is beyond urgent. This is not a game. We may only get one opportunity at this before capital reorganizes itself with its foot on our backs. Indeed, struggle and strife are all around us, but we must shine the light through the trees and use the sounds of the barking dogs to keep us moving. Luckily, we are not without the tools we need. To Harriet Tubman's lantern and shotgun, we have technology, resources, we have relationships. First, there's plenty of money. We have generated plenty of money under global capitalism. Through our labor, our rents, our debts, our purchasing, there's plenty of money, and it's ours. We created it. Together, we will campaign to collectively win that money back by inserting ourselves into decision-making processes, expanding democracy in both the political and economic arenas. Second, we have the machines and the technology we need. They're just currently used to benefit the wrong things. This pandemic shows us what happens when the invisible hand of the market gives us the finger. Our inability to produce and distribute ventilators to hospitals that need them was not due to a lack of technology, but rather due to a complete market failure. GE workers, however, showed us how important it was to turn off the imaginary robot controls of the market and turn on the human decision making when they walked out and said, let's stop making airline engines and for grounded jets and just start making things people need right now. How about that for an idea? And most importantly, there are a ton of people out there who are with us. It may not feel like it given the amount of airspace that cable news gives uh, to 27 angry men with guns at fill in the blank state capitol, but there are far more of us than there are of them. They may not know what a union bug is. They may not know what an organizer is, but they have an imagination for democracy. And if we can tap into their dreams, we can create a shared vision that includes all of us. Our efforts must aggressively reach those who are not yet active in our movements, all of them, to validate their experiences and to help them see their future with us. This crisis in capitalism is an opportunity to build new infrastructure and platforms. The mechanics of our economy are laid bare. Don't let anyone tell you that we have to build it back up the way it was. I have no interest in going back to the way it was last year or the last 10 years or the last 20 years or the New Deal. None of that was built to support me. No, it's time to negotiate a future for ourselves and our family that works for all of us. Over the next 36 hours, we will strategize about how to strengthen and in many instances build for the first time a healthy democracy. And when we talk about democracy, we don't simply mean the ability to vote once a year. For us, democracy is not just a system of political practices. It must also be applied to participation and decision making in all aspects of our economic lives as well. Without this, the whole system of democracy, political and otherwise, is compromised. Yes, we want good laws, but we also want to be a part of enforcing those laws to be the essential worker governing board to the Essential Worker Bill of Rights. As we all know, organizing and collective bargaining is fundamental to democracy in the economic arena, and we want everyone to have access to it in some form. This means expanding what a union contract covers, broadening what individuals can negotiate over, and who they can negotiate with, from their direct boss to the individuals with concentrated economic power in their sector or in their community. We want to apply the brilliant strategy of collective bargaining to every type of employment relationship and ultimately to every type of economic relationship. Throughout the many sessions of this conference, we will discuss applications of these theories, experiments, and lessons learned. And we encourage you to be vigilant in your interrogation of these approaches. Our goal is to win, not just to be right, and definitely not just to have a cute slogan. If we want to honor ourselves and those who came before us, we must make real progress and real impact.
We also know that confronting the system of white supremacy and gender discrimination must remain a central element of this overall strategy to prevent the opposition from dividing workers and weakening our collective power. This is not simply morally right, but not doing so will guarantee our eventual defeat. There are many campaigns that we have been a part of since the last conference in 2016 where we can show, we can directly show a cause and effect relationship to our ability and in some cases our failure to win because of how well we centered or didn't center white supremacy in that fight. From the victories of workers at Lipton Tea in Virginia or the Transform Trash campaign in New York City to the union election defeats at Boeing in South Carolina or Nissan in Mississippi. Last, in this moment, we must break through the myth of scarcity as if there is not enough money to accomplish this level of democracy in the economy. There's plenty of money. There's plenty of money. We know it. We know it because we created it. We created it through our labor, our homes, our debt payments. We created it through the winch we pay, the things we buy. There's plenty of money and it's ours for the taking. We are not asking for handouts. We want our money back. No, Secretary Azar, you will not be able to use our money to create a vaccine that is inaccessible to us. No, congressional leadership, you cannot use our tax dollars to fatten the pockets of corporate landlords with no strings attached. It's our money. We decide how it's spent. Together, we will dive deep into conversations about how to evolve organizing and collective bargaining strategies to a 21st century framework. During our time together, don't expect clear lines between organizing staff and worker leaders. Here, Workers are the best strategists and relationship builders, and staff organizers will not pretend they don't have their own authentic stories to tell. We are not simply interested in showcasing our successes, but also collectively learning from our setbacks, all with the goal of building a more powerful movement. The conference is organized into a set of distinct frames. We'll spend some time focusing on the current moment, honoring our heroes who made this past year famous for hosting the largest number of strikes since 1986, the year before Jobs with Justice was founded. And we will dig into the hope and possibilities the Southern region holds for the future of organizing and collective bargaining through a series of case studies and campaigns. Just because we aren't physically in Atlanta doesn't mean that we've abandoned the region. We won't get to the end of the conference with our, our usual banquet. And this year we were excited to honor a longtime JWJ leader and now the first black woman in the Kentucky State Legislature, Attica Scott. But we will honor her at our award celebration over the summer. And we'll also take some time to celebrate uh, through different social events that we'll talk about later. We'll take some time uh, next as well to remember the people who have been building this network since the beginning, establishing a foundation for all of us to move forward for the next 30 plus years. Before we do that, I just want to take a brief moment to thank our amazing sponsors for making this possible. The American Federation of Government Employees and ULICO are co-hosts, the Service Employees International Union, AFSCME, the American Federation of Teachers, the Teamsters, the Workers Lab, to the many individuals, nonprofits, and worker-friendly businesses that contributed to making this whole event possible, we thank you. Welcome, David J. family, welcome. There is nothing like a Jobs with Justice family reunion. If this is your first conference, welcome. It will not be your last. With that, I want to introduce one of the leaders who has been part of my Jobs with Justice life for at least the past decade, if not a little bit more, co-director of Central Florida Jobs with Justice, and National Board Chair, Denise Diaz. Thank you, Smiley. Thank you, Smiley, for those words and welcoming us. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us um, for our national conference um, as we come together virtually uh, to strategize, to learn, and hopefully inspire each other um, to be able to respond to this urgent moment that we're in. So I want to move us through a um, moment of silence and reflection um, and make an invitation to everyone watching right now to bring into this space, in this moment, the names of the people that are in our hearts and minds right now. Whether it's because uh, they're essential workers or on the front line right now, um, or experiencing hardship and crisis in this very moment, or even those loved ones that we have lost. I invite you to write their names and bring them into the space as we honor our collective grief, love, and hope together.
Thank you. It is in these unprecedented times that it's important to, to take the time to reflect and ground ourselves in why we fight. In why we fight and remember those that have our backs and who through this struggle we honor and continue to build power, worker power, honor the centrality of working people and take action. And it is through that action that we make history and we make change. So thank you for that. And so now it is with my great humbleness um, and just it's great honor to introduce and uh, share a message from Ashley Lewis, who is with us. She's a UAW member um, and leader of the strike against uh, GM that took place this past fall. Um, Ashley Lewis, UAW 598 member. Thanks, so I'm gonna play the video now. There'll be a delay when it finishes. My fellow activists, organizers, workers, I ask you to open your, up your minds, open up your hearts and your ears. Initially, when I was asked to speak at this conference, I was going to speak about my experience during the strike and that fight for the American middle class. But today, I want to talk about something more personal, my father. My mother and father fostered many children. They ended up adopting six kids, and I was one of them. He was a dedicated father who didn't acknowledge the differences in all of us. And in fact, it was his love that he gave to all of us that united us even in his death. I just recently lost him due to this pandemic. He was an Air Force veteran. He was a dedicated employee of General Motors for over 47 years, a UAW member for over 51 years. And now he's gone. My father's patriarch is gone. And it's because of politics over people, profit over people. People like my father, and think of how many loved ones we've all lost during this pandemic. All because when he walked into that hospital, it was immediately understaffed. None of the medical assistants, the janitors, the doctors, the nurses could have been prepared for the magnitude of this pandemic. Two weeks after he entered that hospital, we watched him take his last breath on FaceTime. It robbed us of the ability to be at his bedside, robbed us of the ability to celebrate his life. Contrast that reality to one where government and unions are there to ensure that a hospital is staffed properly there to ensure that there are enough janitors to clean the hospital, to have clean rooms for our frontline workers, to ensure that they have clean sweeps of patient rooms, PPE readily available for not only the employees, but the family members, all made in America. Will my father still be here? Will the fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, and friends of so many of us still be here? Imagine if the infrastructure of OSHA, the CDC, and workplace safety per collective bargaining agreements had been in place. Farm workers, patients, janitors, doctors, all of our family members being protected by having a work, a place, a, a voice in the workplace, by having a voice in the legislative halls. Let's take a step out of the hospitals into the American workforce. This pandemic has affected every sector of our economy. 
Teachers, auto workers, meat packers, you name it. There is no one untouched. One thing remains common in our history. When people came together to ensure that the workplace and the government worked behalf, on behalf of the people, then we overcame some of the most difficult economic times. How many lives must we lose? How many hardworking Americans must suffer because government continues to fail its people? Because the economics of the system are built to favor a few and not we the people. How can we live the American dream when the average CEO makes 844 times the average salary of its worker? How can we educate our children when they're poisoned by the water they drink? How can we afford to give them access to a better education when we cannot afford the exclusivity of zip codes that require six figures or higher? Perhaps this pandemic will shake us into a new American dream. One where we aren't working so hard that we forget to hug our children. That we forget to encourage values like kindness and empathy. An America where we aren't working 70 hours a week and still can't afford health care. An America where educational opportunities aren't limited by zip code. An America where our teachers are respected and honored for ushering in the next generation of America. An America where my father's grandchildren and great-grandchildren will thrive because the loss of his life was not in vain. Do not allow the lives of our family members, of our brothers, our sisters, our friends to go in vain. After the Great Depression, government began working for the people. Unionization rates were high. Thus, 90% of the children born in 1940 ended up in a higher income distribution than their parents. Only 40% of those in 1980 have done the same. You see, the hardworking, the forgotten, the meek will inherit the earth. So long as we stop allowing our differences to distract us from our children's upward mobility. It's time for our, our people, for God's people, to turn our grief into action to turn our sorrow into mobilization and to turn our pain into advocating for not only our communities, but a voice in the workplace. We, all of us collectively, must shake America with a new dream because we can no longer allow our children to live in this America, this nightmare where the lives of those we love are disregarded, dishonored and disrespected in the name of the almighty dollar. While I like to thank you for your time, I prefer to thank you for your action. I prefer to thank you for future actions that will yield a government and a workplace that actually works for my father, for my children, and for we the people. Thank you so much, Ashley, for sharing your heart, your family story with all of us and um, for bringing such power into the room. I'm going to pass this now to Erica Smiley, who's going to introduce our next set of panelists. Thank you, Ashley. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to find the right words to describe our next speaker and the moderator of our first plenary Sure, there's the stuff that's easy to Google online. She leads one of the largest, most powerful unions in the country, one of the few women to do so, even in this era. But that still doesn't fully describe her. She's the one who, in the words of Frank Lumpkin, always brings a crowd. I remember early last year when she marched into the public square of Philadelphia last year with nearly a thousand workers marching with her in the street, 
to protest the Supreme, Supreme Court's decision on Janus. She had the guts to agitate a group of union presidents that we have to do something different or some of us simply won't survive. Most recently, she was one of the first union presidents to reach out to me directly when I took on this position, expressing a dedication to my leadership, but maybe more importantly, to the success of Jobs with Justice and to workers everywhere. I am so glad she's on our side. Please direct your attention to the president of the Service Employees International Union, Mary Kay Henry. Thank you so much, Smiley. I have to say I'm so thrilled to be part of the Jobs with Justice family reunion. And I am incredibly honored that you asked me to play a role in facilitating a panel of courageous leaders all across our movement who've taken direct action in answering the call uh, that you just framed for this entire conference. And I want you to know, I wanna answer your call too. I just thought that was a brilliant way to open uh, this conference and to make crystal clear that this moment uh, we are leading through is uh, a moment where we need to recognize the deep racial and economic inequality that this pandemic is exacerbating and understand as you and Denise and Ashley just called us to that we need to turn our grief into a level of action and mobilization that I've never been a part of in my lifetime, but that I join you, Smiley and Ashley and Denise in believing uh, we can make something really big happen um, that shifts change in a warp speed um, that we've never experienced before. So I just wanted to say three small things before I introduce this incredible panel of leaders. One is I wanted to share uh, Ashley's grief um, and hold you and your family uh, in my heart along with the hundreds of other stories that I've heard from within our membership over the past 12 weeks. Uh, one of the first deaths in our union that I heard about was from a nursing home leader in Detroit, who I've had the privilege of knowing for 25 years, and who was one of the first uh, certified nursing assistants to contract the virus and die. So. I bring Linda Thompson's uh, memory uh, into this family gathering and her memory and the memory of so many others that Denise called us to consider in this Jobs with Justice reunion um, fuels my rage uh, in the same way that I thought smilently, brilliantly outlined for us that uh, corporations and divisive politicians are using this moment in a way that we are not surprised by, because uh, we know uh, what motivates them. And Ashley just made it crystal clear um, that they see profits as more important than people. And they think they have earned the right to decide who gets to live and who gets to die. But we know better uh, as a people and I just wanted to share my story of rage where I stood with three McDonald's fast food workers in a car caravan and then a parking lot action just last week. They had all been exposed to coworkers who had contracted the virus. They were told to wear coffee filters for masks. They uh, were uh, cycled to another store instead of being paid two weeks of sick leave so they could self quarantine. And McDonald's has the audacity to uh, lobby against paid sick um, as we speak. And so that is the kind of corporate behavior that I know that Jobs with Justice family is uniting to challenge in this moment. And that's why my final emotion in this moment is shared with Smiley's opening a tremendous determination and resolve that we can confront white supremacy, we can confront the depths of this economic inequality and use this moment to organize across race, across jobs, across communities. 
uh, to build the better world that we've all been fighting for our entire organizing lives. And that's what brings me to this panel, uh, where I hope, like me, you will be inspired by the courage and leadership uh, we are about to learn from. And the first um, panel member is going to come to us by video. Video. Her name is Betty Douglas, and she's a global movement leader in the fight for 15. Hi, my name is Betty Douglas, and I'm 62 years old, and I work for the McDonald's in St. Louis, Missouri. I've been working for this McDonald's, for this company, for 14 years. I've always known about the power of work and fighting for what, what you believe in. This lesson has fueled my leadership in Fight for 15 because at the age of 12, I've been working and my parents, I had been working in my parents' businesses and my father always has been hard on us and told us, you go for what you're worth. Never let anyone make you feel less than. Right now, in the face of the global pandemic, it's more important than ever for workers across the country, across the world, to rise up together. From the start, McDonald's COVID-19 response has put profits ahead of the workers, which they always have. McDonald employees were told that we couldn't wear masks. And then once the government said that we needed the masks, now they're saying we've got to wear them. And they're not providing, they didn't provide the masks or the gloves or the soap in the proper amount of time. McDonald's failed to act, and this is what happens. A McDonald worker got the virus at work and passed it to his to her mother, and ended up passing. Oh, her mother ended up passing away in Los Angeles, at the corporate-owned office. A worker ended up in a ventilator over a month. In Chicago, a mama whose daughter, a, a mom whose daughter is going through chemotherapy who went on strike for nearly two weeks because she wasn't being given a mask. That's why workers in California, Chicago, Florida, Memphis, St. Louis, and North Carolina have been standing up and speaking and taking actions by going on strike and protesting. Thank you so much to Betty Douglas for that um, incredible story of what is happening both in the United States and around the world as fast food workers stand up and challenge the global capitalism that Smiley opened this conference up with. And now I'm gonna um, introduce another panelist who is a warrior of, from a very famous strike action that all of us witnessed earlier this year Don uh, Pont Pontarelli. Pontarelli. Don, welcome, uh, UFCW leader from Stop and Shop. Thank you, Mary. Don, tell me how to say your name properly. Pontarelli. Pontarelli, welcome. Pontarelli, yes. Thank you, Mary. And thank you to JWJ for the invitation to the conference. And I want to start by offering my condolences to Ashley uh, for the passing of her father. Um, so to start with, my name is Don Ponarelli. I uh, work for Stop and Shop. I've been at Stop and Shop for 34 years. I've been a UFCW member for 34 years. I am a shop steward for 20 years, and I've been on the local 328 executive board for six. So, can you hear me? I can hear you, Don, yes. Okay. So, back in, actually a year ago, April of 2019, uh, 249 stores, 31,000 employees, over five, 
five local unions and three states, we uh, went on strike. Uh, strike took place at one o'clock on April 11th, and it took 17 minutes to open the stores, to empty the stores. Strike lasted for 11 days, and it was, <laughs> there were a lot of different emotions going through everyone uh, over those 11 days. Uh, a lot of uh, sadness, uh, a lot of anger, a lot of anxiousness, uh, but we made it through. That is an amazing mm -hmm. uh, strike, Don. I know that all of us across the country we're cheering the stop and shop workers on from every corner of the country as you did that strike in New England. And I'm incredibly proud of how we've witnessed oh, throughout this pandemic uh, the essential services that retail grocery store workers provide every day. And I think many people in the Jobs with Justice family understand in our bones uh, that we've always been essential workers across the service and care sector. We may be fighting to have our work valued, and we may be fighting to organize unions to get a seat at the table to bargain a better life, but uh, we're aware um, that that work has tremendous value. Uh, well, that, is that's the ironic thing about uh, what's happening right now, as opposed right. to a year ago, because a year ago, we were asking customers not to shop in our stores and cross the picket lines. And when we went back into the stores, we were thanking them for their support. And here we are a year later in the stores working and the customers are actually coming up to us and thanking us for being here for them, being on the front lines, working in the grocery stores and you know keeping food on their table. And how have you but, and your coworkers uh, dealt with the risk, Don, that you feel every day given the spread of the virus? Um, well, there, there have been some workers that, you know, have stayed away from work because, you know, the fear of the spread of the virus and everything. But, uh, I mean, for the most part, we, you know, we, are, we wear our PPE and, you know, follow the guidelines, you know, the distancing rule and, uh, you know, the companies installed the uh, plexiglass you know, petition between the cashiers and the customers. And uh, for the most part, the customers get it. They understand, um, you know, they keep their distance. You know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, you know, when the shelves were empty and people were rushing in and no one really had any idea of what was going on. And, you know, there were real emotions were running high. Customers were, you know, a little short fused along with the co-worker, you know, the workers were too. But I think as we move through this and understand what's going on a little more, I think customers are a little more relaxed. The workers are a little more relaxed. They understand what's happening. And it kind of smoothed it out a little bit. But uh, overall, you know, knock wood, there hasn't been too many cases uh, that I've heard of throughout, you know, the company. That's wonderful. And it's the power of the union to insist on the protective equipment like those plexiglass shields and the personal yes. protective equipment. Uh, there's many, many service and care workers that I'm aware of all across the economy that are still struggling to get the personal protective equipment they need. And I think it goes back to Ashley's question in the video, which is if people had the personal protective equipment they need, would we see as many outrageous deaths in uh, the essential workforce that we've witnessed that's landed heaviest on black and brown families and communities. And that's why I think it's time now to turn and welcome um, Ashley. Uh, you, in addition to that powerful personal story of your own grief and your family's grief, were an incredible leader in the strike last fall against uh, GM and a leader in the United Auto Workers. Ashley, welcome. Talk to us about your direct action experience. Thank you. 
Um, thank you for having me today. I want to thank Kay and actually Sam from Southeast Jobs uh, for Justice in Michigan because they thought of me as uh, being able to come and speak with everyone today. Um, actually, what I want to share first and foremost is for young people, when you're interested in not only um, becoming a part of the movement, don't be afraid to jump into leadership because it, in the course of six years, I've held on to about eight different titles. And so it's not about um, critiquing the, the leadership, it's about actually being a part of the change and making things better. Um, that being said, um, many people know, uh, it was all across the news for six weeks, uh, the UAW went on strike against General Motors. And there were a lot of reasons why we did this, but first and foremost, not only as employees of General Motors, but also as taxpayers of America, we bailed out General Motors twice and they were making record profits. And even with 60 years of collective bargaining with General Motors, they still wanted us to take concessions. They still wanted to take away our health care. They still wanted to maintain temporary workers. They also wanted to, to not be able to insure our jobs because I'm a person who moved all across Michigan three times in one year in order to be able to maintain a job. So when we were on those front lines, there was so much at play. So we had our, um, other UA brother, UAW brothers and sisters who were from Aramark, and they went on strike first. And actually, we were forced to cross that picket line. And this is where legislation comes into play because we're no longer allowed to sympathy strike. So if someone goes on strike, they could actually pull you in and fire you for not coming in to work. So we, we had a, a lot of us, uh, some of us crossed the picket line, and uh, most of us, I will say, probably stay home. But we crossed that picket line and then we're inside of the workplace where you have a plethora of temporary employees who have never been on strike. And as much as you can try to do, as much as you can try to do to prepare, to prepare your workers um, to go on strike is very difficult. But I remember being there and being around a group of temporary employees who were afraid to walk out. I told them if they call us to walk out, we're walking out together because we're walking out for you guys. We're walking out for the fact that they literally don't understand that you don't have temporary families, you don't have temporary bills, and it is truly unfair for this billion dollar corporation to maintain that temporary workforce. And so when we walked out, we were walking out for issues that literally affects every American, whether it be the temporary workforce, the gig workforce, um, healthcare is the number one cause of bankruptcy, um, and also the fact that we need more job stability in America. No one should have to move all across this country to maintain a job. That's very inconsiderate to families and to the employees that work for them. Ben, Ashley, thank you so much for sharing the lesson about leadership and stepping into it and your analysis about global capitalism and what we deserve as working people is incredibly powerful. It sounds like the other lesson from your strike action is to help the public understand that your strike isn't just for the members that are bargaining for the union, but that you're raising issues that are wrong across the economy, like you just told us. Is that right? Absolutely. I, I think that most people get it misconstrued. A lot of times the media has made all union members seem like they are just asking for too much. Quite frankly, even in that opening video, I always like to bring it up. They are making 844 times what we make. Yes. That's what the CEO makes. And yet, yeah. they think it's a problem for us to ask them to maintain our health care coverage, not have temporary workers. And see, if we are the benchmark, then we're setting a benchmark for everyone else across America and not just unionized people. We're talking about non-unionized sectors because we create a benchmark. So it's, it's very important, even if for unions, to make sure that we are not only cascading the message, not only across our membership, but making them understand how we are literally um, creating a, a better vision for the American worker. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. And now I'm going to go to our next strike leader, who's presently on strike, Eduardo Finelli, who is uh, on strike against Orozco Copper Mine in Tucson, Arizona. Welcome, Eduardo. Well, if you're going, the, the bigger you is ours. Thank you, Mary Kay Henry. And thank you, Jobs of Justice uh, National, for having us uh, um, on the 2020 uh, virtual conference.
tell us your story, Eduardo, of what it's been like to hold your coworkers together for eight long months of striking against the copper mine. Oh, we've been uh, on strike since October 13th, uh, 2019. Uh, we're going into the eighth month here pretty soon. Um, we've been uh, going day by day, uh, fighting against uh, multinational uh, global uh, entity, uh, uh, Grupo Mexico. Uh, Grupo Mexico um, is based out of uh, Mexico City, and they have a uh, operations going on in uh, in the United States uh, through a Sarco LLC, who we are on strike against. Uh, we're on a unfair labor practice strike. Been going strong. Uh, 1,700 of, of our members went on strike. And uh, that spans from Texas, Amarillo, Texas, uh, down into uh, Arizona, where we have a uh, Four different properties in Arizona. Amazing fortitude and courage and persistence. We are with you. You are not alone there, Eduardo. The whole Jobs with Justice family has your back, and we want to do whatever we can to support you. Don and Ashley know what it's like, and so um, thank you so much for joining us today. And now our final panelist is Gail Travers who's also been a leader in taking direct action. Welcome, Gail. Clearly. Can you hear me? I can now, Gail, perfect. Okay, great, okay. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me today. It's. Um, if anything, I can talk too much about it, and you may have to rein me in because I can go on endlessly about what this experience has been like for the community. I live in a mobile home park. Um, I moved here in September of 2017 with my teenage grandson, who I'm bringing up because his parents were killed in a car accident. I moved here to be near my son, my only uh, um, surviving child, and I wanted to get closer to them. Uh, I was here for two months before we were purchased by a private equity firm called Sunrise Capital Investors. Uh, this was prior to that. This was owned by a mom and pop type organization. A family basically uh, owned us, and they were offered a great deal of money to sell us. We were sitting ducks. We did not have an idea that investing in mobile home parks had become the newest get rich quick. Uh, it's a killing scheme for private investors, and we were totally unaware. We didn't even have a, a um, tenants organization. Uh, everyone was shocked because the first thing they did was raise the rent, like 40 percent. Um, these people that live here, we've had people that lived in this park for 40 years. They're retired. They're elderly. We have handicapped. We have young families. We have... Um, a very nice community here. There's a sense of pride of ownership, and people were stunned, and the injustice of it was horrible. Um, we decided to form a tenants organization, and through that organization, we got in touch with MH Action, who helped us become politically active. We decided that even though it was against the law to do so, because our strike, we were striking not on habitability but um, because of the um, rent hike. Um, we were on strike for eight months where we didn't pay our rent. The money went into an escrow account. Our goal was really to buy this park because there is funding that you can get in New York State to help you, and I think all over the country, to help you buy your park and form cooperatives or land trusts or other um, models of cooperative living. Uh, we were able to, through the rent strike, we were able to have enough power to pressure the owners uh, to let them realize, look, we're not giving in, we're not giving up. We, they um, agreed to sell us for fair market value, uh, but contingent on that, we needed to release the strike money, which we did in good faith. 
We did all the due diligence activities that you have to do before you purchase a property like this. It was quite expensive. We went through a nonprofit called Pathstone, and they helped us with all this and taught us how to, to run a cooperative. At the last hour um, before we could purchase, um, Sunrise Capital Investors backed out of the deal, saying that they wanted a million more than what the fair market value was for the park. So here we lost our um, we lost our what I would say our um, our power by giving up the rent monies. The rent strike was over. We were deflated, depressed, scared. Um, that happened, I think, in November. Then winter came, and we were in Buffalo, New York. The winters are harsh. We all are like hobbits or like <laughs> like bears. We're in hibernation. Um, but now it's springtime, and we're we're starting to get together again to talk about what can we do. We need to get out from under the ownership of corporate owners. They are, and the, with the with the COVID nineteen, they sent out letters that really galled me, saying how we're all in this together. And that whole phrase, "we're all in this together." Um, really offended me because yeah. they are not understandably in it. Gail that would be offensive we're, we're offended and so we're um, we're trying to um, start again to see how miserable we can make life for these corporate owners and we can do a good job we have about my understanding of about 30 people who are arrears in rent right now 30 homes out of 120 and we're you know, they give us an inch, we take a mile. We're doing everything we can to make their life miserable, um, including Gail, you're such an inspiration <laughs> to tell that story in such a Reader's Digest version. And uh, yes. I can hear in your voice um, how much struggle and pain. And um, you just gave us hope at the end here that as spring comes, you're reconnoitering with all of your other um, community and we have your back. We want to make uh, you successful in this next effort. And I just think this panel has been such an expression of how each and every leader answers the call by taking the direct action and doing what Smiley laid out at the beginning, which is this is a moment. Um, I can feel it in my bones. I can hear it in all of your voices. Uh, a moment of reckoning uh, that the, uh, is built on the past 12 weeks being such a shock to our system, the grief um, that we heard from Ashley and that I know many of us hold in our hearts, the number of people that have died from this virus surpassed already, the number of people our nation lost over years during the Vietnam War. We now have 33 million people that have filed for unemployment and we uh, the projections are it's headed to 40 million, and that millions of people are staying at home while millions more are essential workers on the front lines of this pandemic that are risking death uh, to go to work every day. And so I think um, when Smiley framed this conference, she talked about this as a reckoning, and I just wanted to underscore that. I, too, believe this is a reckoning and that the shock has woken us up to the magnitude of the crisis that we have already um, named and have been recognized and that Jobs with Justice has been at the forefront of organizing. And so I really believe, given the courage and lessons that you all shared on this panel, that we can take that into this moment and explode our organizing and mobilization to a level of noise and disruption that this country has never seen, and that once and for all, we can confront white supremacy, dismantle structural racism, and force corporations to pay their fair share into our pockets as workers and into our government so every community can thrive. And I'm proud to be uh, in this fight with each and every one of you. And we're going to round out our direct action panel with a direct action, which Eduardo Palencio is going to call us to a way that we can use our digital phones right now uh, to support the strikers in uh, Tucson. Eduardo. That's right. Um, you can support strikers. Uh, join and support the ongoing a circle strike by signing the pledge and this pledge 
this pledge you could find on um on our uh on our twitter page usw937 and also at our facebook page uh united steelworkers local 937 um if you get on twitter you go to at g mexico under slash uh official for grupo mexico or just type in grupo mexico and express your outrage and support for and the support for striking workers and let grupo Mex mexico know uh and a circle llc uh, let them know how you feel and we want a fair contract and we want it today.